Okay, we'll make a start. I think that's everyone admitted. Um, so hello, good evening everyone and a really warm welcome to everyone joining us for our Corporation Live event this evening, uh, where we're going to be discussing the issue of worker buyouts and a British Macora law. Uh, my name's Emma Foody, I'm Assistant General Secretary for the Court Party and I'm going to be chairing this evening's session. Um, so just to kick things off tonight, there's a few tips about how we can make it as interactive for everyone to, to take part and as easy as possible. So firstly, for those of you who might be hard of hearing, we're working with the RNID to close caption this event. So if you want to view this captioning, you need to enable it yourself by pressing the CC icon on the bottom tools panel of your phone or computer. Um, also to make you aware, this Zoom call is being recorded. Many of our members can't access it live, so we want to make it available to view via the co-op's YouTube channel. So if you don't want your image to be seen for any reason, please make sure to, uh, to put yourself on, on audio only. In addition, you've been muted just to make sure that the content of the call is clearer uh, to prevent any interruptions and any background noise that might occur. And um, so only those speaking will have their sound enabled. But we've got an amazing set of speakers taking part today. And if we do have time at the end, following all of their contributions, we will hold a question and answer session. And um, if you do want to ask a question, if you pop your question in the chat box, which is being monitored by my colleague, um, and in order to get through as many as possible, I'll ask them on your behalf. And then finally, just before we start, I do obviously want to emphasise that the Cooperative Party believes that our values should be reflected in our actions as well as our policies. And we want all of our members and all of our event participants to feel safe, welcome and respected. Um, so please ensure that you abide by this when you're making your contributions today. And I look forward to hearing them. Um, so just a quick word on the context for this evening and what we're going to be discussing. Uh, in Italy, when a business is failing, its workers have the right to buy out all or part of it with financial support and, adv and specialist advice. And that's known as a Macora law. And the Cooperative Party is campaigning for a British Macora law, as we think that workers know their businesses best and have the biggest stake in its success. And so without further ado, I'll hand over to our first speaker. Our first speaker is Christina Rees MP. She's been campaigning in Westminster for a British Macora law and just a couple of weeks ago secured a debate on this very issue. Over to you, Chris. Thanks, Emma, and it's so good to be with you all this evening. So I'm going to just set the scene for tonight's very exciting event. As Robert Owen, founder of our movement, born on the 14th of May, 1771, in Newtown, Powys, in beautiful Wales, said, the lowest state of humanity is experienced when the individual must labour for a small pittance of wages from others. UK cooperatives know that narrow ownership of the UK economy has caused inequality by preventing economic growth and making the UK vulnerable to economic shocks. This was evident a long time before the first lockdown in March 2020, but became prominent during the pandemic. Too much power and wealth rests with a small number of investors, shareholders and executives. Decisions are often made for the benefit of the powerful and the wealthy and not for the benefit of communities, workers, consumers, and the environment. As part of our own In the Future report, we conducted some polling, which showed that only 10% of the public believe that the economy prioritized wealth sharing before the pandemic. Nearly 70% believe that post-pandemic is a period that will provide an opportunity to widen ownership and give communities more say in how businesses and the economy operate and to shape our lives. In Italy, the former industry minister, Giovanni Macora, established the worker buyout system more than 30 years ago. Macora law gives Italian workers the right and financial support to buy out all or parts of an at-risk business and establish it as a worker-owned cooperative. Workers are given a lump sum advance to use as capital for the buyout and are given support and advice to make it successful. The Macora Law Fund is currently managed by Cooperazione Finanza Impresa, I'll call it CFI, which as an institutional investor uses the resources conferred by the Italian Ministry of Economic Development to finance the growth of cooperative enterprises through a combination of equity and debt capital, lines of invention, 
intervention. Recipients of the intervention are small and medium sized enterprises, which are then set up to be a production and work cooperative and a social cooperative. I was fortunate to be granted a Westminster Hall debate on Macora Law in September, and I urged the UK government to introduce legislation to give workers an opportunity to request ownership during business succession and to provide an early warning in advance of insolvency or when viable businesses are at risk of disposal so that workers could have time and ability to assess the scope of acquisition, prepare a cooperative business model and have the opportunity to bid for a business at risk of shrinking or closure. A UK Macora law would sustain businesses and help the UK move to a fair and democratic economy through our cooperative values. I suggested that the UK government should follow my friend Mark Drakeford, the First Minister of Wales, and appoint a UK minister with specific responsibilities for the cooperative sector. And I'm sure that the Welsh cooperators on the call tonight know that it's Vaughan Gethin, a great Welsh cooperative. Bay's Minister Paul Scully responded to my Westminster Hall debate, and I took pleasure in reminding him that Mark and his Welsh Labour government were overwhelmingly re-elected last May on a manifesto which pledged to provide greater support for worker buyouts. And Mark has said many times that he will work with the cooperative sector and the Wales Cooperative Centre to double the number of worker-owned businesses in Wales. And I'm absolutely delighted that my old friend Hugh Ranker Davis MS for Ogmore and Chair of the Senate Cooperative Group is joining us tonight to tell us about his employee ownership bill, which he introduced in the Welsh Parliament last Wednesday. And another old friend, Derek Walker, Chief Executive of the Wales Cooperative Centre since 2010, is going to tell us all about the cooperative initiatives that his organisation has created, advised on and supported in communities throughout Wales. But back to my debate for a minute. I asked Minister Scully some specific questions. Has he conducted an assessment of the benefits of the cooperative sector to the UK economy? If not, would he please do so? Would he increase the size of the UK cooperative sector? Has he considered the benefits of worker buyouts for Atrix businesses in the UK? Would he provide financial support to workers who want to buy out their business? And would he introduce a Macora law type provision into UK legislation? Unfortunately, Mr. Scully's responses to all my asks were no. After the debate, I left Westminster Hall with very mixed emotions. I was grateful that Mr. Speaker had granted me the opportunity to put the case for a UK Macora law to the UK government minister. I always get nervous before making a speech, so I was pleased that I delivered the speech without letting us cooperators down. Not too many hiccups. But when my adrenaline rush had subsided, I was really disappointed that the minister's warm words were all rhetoric and no substance. However, following the debate, I had two lovely surprises, which lifted my spirits. I received an email from Ed Miliband's political advisor, John T would watch the debate and Ed wants to put Macora Law into UK Labour Party policy. So Joe Fortune, Rob Bates and I have since met John T and it was a very good meeting. And I've got everything crossed, including my eyes, that Macora Law becomes part of the next UK Labour Party general election manifesto. And I received a letter from Camillo du Baron de Dinis who is the CEO of Cooperative Cooperative Zone Finanza Impressa, I should really call it CFI, saying that he appreciated my Westminster Hall debate speech and Camillo invited me to be a guest speaker at the CFI 35th anniversary later this year. I immediately accepted Camillo's very kind invitation and I invited Camillo to join us tonight to explain the amazing work of the CFI. And it's my great honor to welcome my new friend, Camilla, to join us this evening. So back to you, Emma. I'm looking forward to listening to our wonderful speakers. Thank you very much. 
Thank you so much, Christina. It's fantastic to hear about the work that you've been doing in Westminster and that that has, you know, has reached over, over Europe and to, has brought Camillo to us today. So thank you for that. Um, our next speaker is Hugh Aranka Davies. Uh, Hugh, as has been mentioned, he's the MS Brockmore and chair of the Welsh Parliament Cooperative Group. Um, our, just last week, Hugh proposed a, a Welsh Macora law in the Senate to support worker buyouts. Um, so it'll be really interesting to hear about his experiences and how he's been taking the, the case forward in Wales. So Hugh, over to you. That's great. Thanks, Emma. And lovely to see everybody tonight and to follow Chris as well, because she's been doing so much in pushing this in Westminster. So we're trying to do our little bit here in Wales. And in some ways, we are pushing it open door. I mean, it's great that in Wales, where we have a Welsh Labour Party in government with a record number of cooperators, of course, on the back benches, but also in the cabinet as ministers. And we have a minister for the cooperative economy as well. Uh, and that really helps. Now, it doesn't mean that it's easy and that we're going to get this stuff done overnight, but it does actually mean that we have an open door to discuss this with ministers. So what we did last week was, following on actually from Christine's example up in Westminster, is that we put forward a proposition. Uh, we were lucky to get in a ballot where we were selected for a legislative proposition that we debated in the Senate, and we had great support. We had good cross-party support, with one exception, I have to say. Uh, the one exception won't surprise you to know, slightly disappointing. Um, it was a slightly naive and out of date uh, contribution from a Conservative member who described the uh, Marcora law and the uh, ambition for doubling the number of worker owned cooperatives as a throwback to the 1980s. But there we go. We can't bring everybody with us on this. But uh, it had Liberal support, it had Plaid Cymru support, and it had Labour support as well. Um, and when it came to the vote at the end of it, and bear in mind that this was not a motion to, it was not a motion to actually take forward to enact legislation. There's a similar um, model in, in Westminster as well, where it was in effect a take note and support the debate or stop it dead in its tracks. So what this was, the Senate actually voted in favour of a principal debate on the Marcora law. Now that's a significant step. For a UK Parliament, the Senedd uh, Cymru, the Welsh Parliament, to actually vote in favour of a Macora law and other things that would double the economy. And why? Well, because we already have within the Welsh Government, uh, within the manifesto, the Welsh Programme for Government reads, in building a stronger, greener economy, it reads, we will create an economy which works for everyone, grounded in our values of progressive change, going forward together in the spirit of cooperation, not competition. So it's right at the heart of the manifesto. But in fact, that same program for government covering this six Senate period for the next five years reiterates a manifesto pledge word for word. It's one, that's at the, it's one that the Cooperative Party worked hard to make sure it was in there. It says, it pledges to provide greater support for worker buyouts and seek to double the number of employee owned businesses. Now that is hugely welcome. And the debate uh, last week moved it on a notch by the minister actually agreeing at the end of the debate to sit down with myself, with Derek from the Wales Cooperative Centre who's here on the call tonight. And I'm looking forward to hearing Derek speak as well uh, to discuss this, uh, to discuss actions we can take to actually double the number of employee owned businesses, but also to discuss whether or not a Macora law could work in Wales. But let me be frank to you all, there are challenges because in Wales, we don't have all the powers. So if you look at the classic iteration, the classic way that a Macora law works, it isn't simply, simply legislating to put the support there and to legislate to allow workers uh, to have that right to buy out a company that is, might be struggling in part or entirely, but they believe it's got a future it actually puts the resources behind it as well. And it could be, for example, by taking as in the Italian Macora law, a couple of years of benefits as a lump sum contribution from workers to actually help with the purchase and the run-in of a company going forward. Now we don't have the powers over benefits and pensions and so on, but the very fact that the minister has said, come in now, sit down with us. We're willing to talk through this and see what we can do in Wales is great. And if you, I think this can't work. Well, let's look at Wales 
as an example, in a very different scenario, in very desperate situation, uh, you can actually see an example of a worker-led buyout of an organization. We got many, by the way, but if you go back nearly 30 years now and you look at Tower Colliery, heck, the Tower Colliery story is so good, they made an opera about it. Now, this is a, class, this is a worker buyout, but it's a worker buyout in the teeth of conservative opposition when, with the mine closure, plo, uh, closure program at the time there, where the workers sat in that pit, refused to come out until the government said, well, okay, we let you do whatever you can do. And they took their redundancy pay and they bought the mine out. That gave that over two decades of viable life within the mine, but also very good livelihoods for those miners. But it doesn't end there. Tower Adventure, some of you will have heard now that there's an, a new zip world in uh, South Wales. It flies across the top of uh, Hirwine. Well, it's flying across the top of Tower, Tower Colliery. That is now Tower Adventure Limited. So they mutate, they go on. They, they're still creating those jobs. And with the money rerouted back into the economy, owned and managed by local people for local people. Now imagine if we could take an example like that and we could replicate that a hundredfold or a thousandfold within Wales, small and large ones. And that does happen. So we have in Wales ca uh, companies such as the first fully cooperative taxi company in Wales in Cardiff called Drive. For those of you not from Wales, you, uh, you might understand that whenever we get into a cab, we always say, how much does it drive? How's it going, Drive? Any driver is called Drive in Wales. So Drive is a cooperative owned cab company. We've got Splash Community Trust. We've got ones in recyclables and renewables, such as Too Good to Waste and Natural Way, all successfully operating under an employee ownership model. And there's more I'm sure that Derek can talk to you about as well. So that's the power of actually employee ownership. When work, there are so many advantages which we laid out in the debate. That feeling of ownership, the drive that comes with that, the, the increased value within the company and the local economy as well. Derek will talk to you about this more. It's not a silver bullet, we know that. It's not for every situation for, and for every company in succession or where part of the company is in difficulty. But wouldn't it just be great if we could give workers their own chance to own and manage their own workplace, secure their own future and root it in their own local economies as well, instead of taking that money out of their areas and giving it to some other shareholders far, far away. That's what a Welsh Macora law could do. Thanks, Emma. Thank you so much for that contribution, Hugh. It's fantastic to hear about those examples in Wales um, and of the work that you're doing in the Senate there, which we all really appreciate. Um, next to speak, we have Matthew Lawrence. Uh, Matthew is Director at Commonwealth. Uh, Commonwealth is an organisation which focuses on the development and communication of ownership policies and institutions, um, institutions that are democratic and inclusive and social in the purpose that they have. So it'll be really fascinating to hear his thoughts uh, on a British Macora law from, from that particular perspective. Matthew. Great, thanks very much, Emma, and, and great to follow on um, from other speakers. I thought I'd just start with sort of one statistic from today's budget to set a little bit of the sort of context as to why um, a law like this and a wider sort of movement to democratise the economy is needed. And so I don't know if people saw, but one of the sort of striking but sort of buried statistics in the budget was that real wages that are expected to continue to stagnate deep into the 2020s, meaning we'll have had almost two decades of essentially no rises in real wages for ordinary workers, families and communities. And really at the heart of that is, you know, deep power imbalances in our society, in our economy and in our workplaces. And what, of course, cooperatives do is begin to democratise power, begin to democratise how work is organised, the purpose of workplaces. They're not, you know, as you said, they're not silver bullets for everything. But they can begin to address some of those deep fault lines that we then see you know, emerging in things like flatlining wages. So I think it's really important, um, you know, context to talk about it. Specifically on the work buyouts, I think the first thing to say is like, you know, it's useful to like focus in on the, the opportunity. Um, so there's, it's estimated that in the next two to three years, because of sort of, you know, um, aging business owners moving into retirement, demographic changes, et cetera, et cetera, um, so-called sort of silver tsunami, there's roughly about 120,000 small to medium-sized businesses in the UK that are expected to sort of change ownership hands. So if only 5% of those transition into 
cooperatives or employer-owned firms or you know a different model, but ideally cooperatives, that would almost double sort of the number of entities that are cooperatives in the UK. So there's a huge opportunity there, but then there's also risk because you know at the moment you know I'd probably take an unfortunate bet that we won't see anything like five percent. And in fact, what we're more likely to see is otherwise successful businesses, businesses built up by the knowledge and skill and commitment of the workers, either, you know, just closing down uh, with the founder, with a sort of, you know, sort of main owner being snapped up by private equity. We've seen throughout the COVID crisis, private equity, a very extractive, um, aggressive form of ownership model, hoovering up you know, care homes, property, businesses across the UK, as you can see them moving in. Or you could see sort of, you know, just a sort of the breaking up and the selling off of assets and sort of the breaking down of the company. So there's a real risk that, you know, there's this big opportunity, 120,000 viable businesses that are going to transition in the, in the years ahead. But there's a risk that, you know, we just miss that and that it actually accentuates some of those problems about inequalities in ownership, inequalities in power. So, so how, I mean, how to take advantage uh, and, you know, Chris's bill, and it's fantastic to hear that John T uh, and Ed, Ed Milbans on our board. So I'm, I'm glad that he was supportive, but the work that Chris and Hugh and others are doing to push it. And in some ways, you know, the, you know, the bill that uh, Chris proposed and others, the, the details are there. But I think the key thing in, in some ways is to think about the law, not just in terms of buying out in times of distress, but about sort of an ability sort of at any point of ownership transition for workers to be the first point of call um, at first, you know, right of refusal on whether they can, you know, be given the time to negotiate a buyout. They won't always take that up, but it's having that sort of space and window of opportunity. And to do that, I guess there's a couple of things required. So one is obviously the legal framework um, to institute that, um, you know, providing that sort of legal space, legal guarantee to workers that they will be given the opportunity to come together to think about, discuss and potentially propose a sort of buyout and what the governance structure would that would be. I think the second thing then would be sort of finances. You know, a lot of the, you know, I think I don't often praise the coalition government, but you know, the uh, some of the work that Vince Cable did on, you know, and it's not perfect, but the employee ownership trust model and the way that you can sort of leverage future income to, you know, sort of use that as sort of uh, future income of a company, use that future income as a way to then borrow to buy out equity in a company. So you, there's, you know, there's potentially ways that workers can finance buyouts on their own, but very often they'll need to borrow externally. When they borrow externally, who are they borrowing from? And so, it's, you know, do we need to think about something like a cooperative development bank that can all that can scale the democratic economy, provide the finance for workers who've got the capability and talent but need some financing capital? And then there's a sort of third question around sort of um, you know capabilities. They're not just in sort of finance and legal frameworks, but just that basic sense of you know our work is being supported in terms of knowing the regulatory frameworks, knowing the auditing and the accounting, you know, all the basics of nuts and bolts of running an organization that you know workers have that i you know, believe they have that tacit and actual knowledge and capability uh, within themselves but you know sometimes it's hard to navigate and i think there we can look to some places like um you know the cooperative center in wales uh cooperative development scotland so that you know these are the type of institutions that uh, england and northern ireland lack but i think could be interesting to look at so i think sort of you know there's a sense of like we kind of know in a way, I think a lot of this progressive economic agenda, including um, the property agenda, but I think there's, sort of, there's this paradox right now in that we kind of know a lot of the things that we need to do. You know, we need to sort of strengthen worker rights, trade unions, collective bargaining, public investment, our poor laws. We kind of know what we need to do. It's a question of how we get there, how do we build the power to actually make real change and how everything is organised. And so there I just sort of, I guess, point to a couple of interesting things that I think are relevant in our poor law. The UK debate, but I think it's to other areas. So I think you know the key thing I stress really, and tonight's call is a great example of it, is yes, change can happen at Westminster, but I think in the devolved administrations, the Welsh government, the Scottish government, and I think increasingly, you know, in the sort of combined authority of the city mayors, we're attempting to sort of chart very different directions to the sort of economic agenda of Westminster. There's real potential there. And so I think that it's you know it's vital to continue to plug away at the change at the UK wide level. And I think you know, because the limits and sort of you know, fragmented nature of devolution, there's only so much that the Welsh government, the Scottish government, and Andy Burns can do. But nonetheless, I think it's really exciting and a big opportunity to explore as far as possible how far you know, a Montcoral or K level can be sort of prefigured um, 
by action in Wales and Scotland and sort of, you know, cities and towns of England. So I think that's the, you know that sort of political sense where for me the energy and excitement is to really sort of test the boundaries of where we can go now um, while trying to build that sort of social um, and political momentum for reform at UK level. And yeah, so I just end by saying, yeah, I think we've got the solutions, we kind of know broadly the mechanics of how Macaul law would work in the UK. It's about building sort of the cooperative movements that you know, real change can come. That's that's brilliant. Thank you so much for that, Matthew. And some really interesting insights in there, as you say, not just at kind of where we can push for change at a national level, but how we actually can push for national change, but on on kind of, you know, in, in, in regional senses around the devolution agenda as well. So thank you for that. Um, next up, we're going to be hearing from Derek Walker. Uh, Derek's the Chief Executive at the uh, Welsh at the Wales Co-op Centre, which is the UK's largest cooperative development agency. And as we talk about the need for a Macora law and the opportunities that it brings and the positive steps that are already taking place in Wales, it'd be great to be able to hear your views and take on this particular topic. Over to you, Derek. Great, thank you very much, Emma, and nice to see everyone this evening. Um, I've been asked to talk about the benefits of employee ownership. Um, and um, I guess most of us would be convinced by those anyway, but I think it's worth reiterating why um, we're promoting employee ownership and why it's a good thing for all parties, really. It's really a no-brainer. Um, so we're a co-op development agency in Wales. Um, as Emma said, we're the largest co-op development agency uh, in the UK. And to just come back to Matthew's point, I think part of building the cooperative economy is seeing the infrastructure and the capacity and we would love to see sister organisations in parts of England, across England and in Northern Ireland, um, working alongside us to uh, strengthen the cooperative economy. I think it's an essential part of taking this agenda forward. Um, we work with most employee buyouts in Wales, so we're very lucky to have support from Welsh Government to provide free of charge support to help businesses transitioning to employee ownership. So most of the businesses that, um, or nearly all the businesses that transfer to an employee-owned business structure in Wales would, um, would work with us. Um, you, it hasn't been mentioned so far, but we have seen significant growth in the number of employee-owned businesses over the last few years. Um, there are around 730 across the UK at the moment, and uh, around 250 of those as of June were, were, were set up in the last 18 months. So you can see that's a significant increase in the number of employee owned businesses in the last few years. So I think people are starting to see the real benefits of the model. But one of the challenges uh, that I'll talk about a little bit later is awareness and um, people understanding um, that um, employee ownership is uh, a possibility for them to consider. Um, I think the majority of employee owned businesses are uh, coming about because it's a succession route for business owners. So they're thinking about a succession route for their business. Um, but we're probably missing a lot of businesses that are perhaps closing or, um, uh, you know, shutting down for other reasons, perhaps, um, that could consider an employee ownership model, um, but that is not being considered. And as a result, perhaps jobs are lost or businesses are moved to the other parts of Europe, potentially. So, um, you know, we need to promote the model in more situations, I would say. So the benefits of employee ownership are really, really strong. It's a bit very convincing model. Um, the Employee Ownership Association did some work and we were involved in some of that work looking at employee ownership. They did the ownership effect inquiry back in 2018 to gather some evidence about the benefits of employee ownership. And um, for individuals, I think it's very clear. For individuals, uh, workers in those business businesses, we know that they will have a greater job satisfaction, uh, usually better well-being as a result of having some say and control over how the business is run. I've got a background working in the trade unions in the TUC, and we know that um, if pay levels are fair and uh, um, good enough for, to have a good life, then that is an important factor in people's well-being and job satisfaction, that they have the ability to have a say in how the business is run. Uh, of course, there's a financial benefit as well. So if these businesses do well, 
um, the surpluses created by the businesses are shared then between uh, the employees, either directly or through a trust. And so, you know, there's a significant financial benefit for employees of the employee ownership uh, model. There's really important benefits for the business too. So um, you'll see greater uh, levels of productivity. We call it, uh, one of our clients actually, I, I won't take credit for it, one of our clients called it the productivity whoosh effect when employees took on the business and they saw it as their business then in a far greater extent and they saw a real productivity gain um, from that business. Um, also, you see better retention levels, particularly important, I guess, in the current jobs market. You know, people are more likely to stay with that business or be attracted to working in that business uh, because of its um, business model. Um, you see greater levels of innovation, so people are free to think about new ideas and set things up. And, um, you know, it's clear you see a lot more innovation in these businesses. We did a seminar just the other week with Cardiff Business School, actually, and we invited um, the, the two men, uh, the, one of them who came along, who set up Ardman Animation, Animations in Bristol. Um, the Wallace and Grom Gromit company, and they're an employee-owned business. And what he said, David Sproxton, one of the founders, was they really saw during the pandemic that because of the culture, the way in people, the way in which people were engaged in the business, understood the business, and were free to sort of act within the business um, during the pandemic. That really helped. That helped with communication. That helped with being fleet of foot and responding to the situation. And he really remarked on the impact of the employee ownership model in, in, in that kind of crisis situation. We're very interested in employee ownership because of the wider benefits to the local economy. So um, in Wales, you know, and, and other parts of the ASEAN, other parts of the UK, um, we want to keep good quality jobs in Wales. So we have often supported um, businesses who wanted to, business owners who want to pass their business on because they want to keep those good quality jobs in that rural part of Wales potentially where where otherwise that business would have been bought up, bought up and moved abroad or to a richer part of the country and um, they wanted to keep those good quality jobs in Wales so an employee ownership model anchors that business locally. Um, they're far less likely to uh, up sticks and move as a result of the ownership structure. The people are also, as I said, going to usually benefit financially from the from the model, and they will spend that money locally in the local economy. So that has benefits for other local businesses and the local the local economy uh, more generally. And um, it's an important transition model. So we were just hearing about that. Um, you know, we find that, uh, and I, I think it's found in research, uh, it's certainly found in research, that often businesses fail, not because there's business failure, but it's a transition failure. So there's a problem with the transition. It's being passed on to people without the skills, or it's being passed on to, um, you know, people, perhaps in family members who don't want to run the business. And the business fails for that reason, not because there's a business failure. So to tackle that sort of succession time bomb, we have a particularly high number of older business owners in the SME sector in Wales and to tackle that time bomb employee ownership can be a route to anchoring those businesses in, in, in the country and in the locality. And finally for exiting business owners and for employees there are uh, tax benefits which are attractive. Um, for business owners we find that they want to do the right thing by their employees, those employees have helped them build up the business so they want to um, do the right thing by keeping that business alive and keeping those jobs available to them. Um, they keep the integrity of the business as well. You know, the business that they've established that they really believe in, that integrity is, uh, is maintained through um, passing it on to people who know the business and perhaps run it in the way that they would uh, like to see it run. So there are many reasons for um, supporting employee ownership, not just in a situation of crisis or possible failure or closure of the business, but because, uh, you know, you want to see these businesses start up in this model, but also uh, as a succession route. So uh, it really is a, a very convincing model and all the evidence backs it up. You know, just briefly to say, I was asked to say a bit about the sort of timescales and the work involved in in supporting a business into employee ownership. 
Well, it's, it's not always easy and it does take time and um, we can work sometimes uh, very quickly uh, and, and do this kind of transition in six months. I think that might be our record, but it can take a long time and you can do a lot of work and for the, the deal to fall down because uh, you know the workers or the business owner or something, the finance can't be fine, found and, and the deal collapses. Um, so it can take a long time. So we need to do something to make that whole transition uh, process easier. But as I say, the, 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 the quickest one we probably done, did was six months. And that was a business in Ebervale that was uh, a business that was going to close because the multinational that owned it wanted to move out of that area, didn't want to do small volume um, and packaging, which is what this business was about. And they wanted to close the factory, but there was a viable business there. So we supported the employees to buy that business and they are you know, running that business successfully now, uh, many, many years later in an area of Wales that really needs that kind of employment. So it is possible to be done very quickly, um, but usually it takes a lot more time. Um, what I would say finally, in terms of the Makora law, you know, I think Hugh and Christine have um, hit it on the head really and why we're doing this. It's uh, the legislation can be really helpful, um, but the wider support is helpful too. So, you know, I think, giving people, workers, the opportunity to be asked and to be involved in um, an employee ownership, in employee buyout situation is going to be critical in making more of these opportunities happen. Too often um, they're, they're missed out of the loop or they're not giving enough given enough time uh, to look at employee ownership. So giving them the right to be asked about employee ownership, I think is really important. Um, I think it sends a hugely important signal that employee ownership and employee owned businesses and cooperative approaches uh, are part of an important part of the economy and how we see the future of the economy. So I think it does that job too. But we also need to address the awareness raising, which legislation would help with uh, potentially as a result of the, of the law, but also, um, uh, you know, we, you need to do that wider raising awareness and you need the finance, you need the finance to be available to make it easier for employees to uh, raise the funding to buy the business should they need to do so. So it's a really exciting um, opportunity and hopefully we can do this in Wales uh, and across the UK and we're really looking forward to playing our part in, in making it happen. So thank you Emma. Thank you so much for that contribution, Derek. I think uh, you know you made some really strong, compelling arguments about why work buyouts are, are, are so important, uh, not just to the cooperative sector, uh, but more generally. So thank you for that. Um, before I get on to our last speaker, just a quick reminder um, for any questions that you might want to submit. Um, if you want to have any of your questions put to any of our panellists or indeed all of our panellists, um, then please just put them in the in the chat box and, uh, and however many we can get through in the time available, we'll obviously seek to do so. Um, but so that takes us on to our final speaker. Uh, the last of our speakers is uh, Camilo de Berardinis, the Administratore Delegato at the Coop Arizioni. Finanza Impressa in Italy, um, also known as the CEO of the CFI, um, which is a little bit easier for me to say if, I, if I'm being honest. Um, the Marcora law um, that we talked about that's already been established in Italy is a, is a fund for the formation of cooperative enterprises amongst employees in, at times of their companies being in crisis. And it's through the CFI that that fund is actually currently managed to use in the resource that's made available from the Italian government to finance the growth of co-ops, as well as offering that important support and advice that, uh, that we've heard so much about today and developing those as well. So Camilla, just thank you so much for joining us this evening to share your experiences of how the Macora Law actually works in practice. We'd be really delighted for you to share those with us tonight. Uh, <clears throat> thank you for inviting me. A, a brief introduction. Uh, in Italy, the creation of new cops to purchase the target company has been favored not only by the Marcora law, but also by the new Marcora, which together with other laws, have favored the use of worker buyouts to overcome companies in crisis and prevent job losses. Marcora saw in uh, the cooperative system the best way for workers to participate in the management of their own businesses and the right way for communities to revitalize farms, farms in facing a crisis. Marcora believed that the cooperative movement could be regarded as a third way between private enterprise and public assistentialism. 
In other words, Marcora's objective was to defend employment and to leverage the entrepreneurial capacities of workers through, through the setting up of new cooperatives. This is also because one of the distinguishing features of cooperatives is, they, is that they put people to the center of the business by putting them before profit. Uh, if you want, you can follow in, uh, in the document I, I sent. Uh, and now I explain the, uh, the, the uh, operating CFI. CFI is an instrument for an active work policy and institutional investor operating uh, since 1986 as the instrument to implement the Marcora law. Set up with a specific mission of public interest uh, with the Ministry for Economic Develop Development holding a 98.6% share of the capital and another thing role as a member in the administrative and supervisory board. Uh, with a company capital of 98 million euro, a network of 107 million euro, it has carried, carried out operations for more than 300 million and funded uh, 554 companies. Uh, uh, CF, CFI participates in cooperative enterprise risk, supporting investment and projects, but also offers assistance and consultancy for initiatives aimed at setting up cooperatives promoted by workers from companies in crisis to reinforce the workers' competence. Uh, our mission is support the setting up development of workers production and social cooperatives and social cooperatives promote increase and safeguard employment strengthen company ability to grow and compete uh, our, our objectives to promote and support workers buyout to the setting up of cooperatives by workers of companies sequestered or confiscated from organized crime to relaunch their business, the succession of company favoring the possibility for employees to buy the company when the owner decides to close the business, and finally social cooperatives. Uh, uh, La Marcora Law uh, had uh, like recipients small medium side enterprises work production and social cooperatives uh, uh, types of financing are risk capital uh, cfi holds a temporary not more than 10 years and minority shareholding with a repayment of 25 percent due at, uh, at, at the fifth year uh, a shareholding of the maximum value equal to the company capital or double in the case of uh, reserves and, and member loans. And, and member loans. <clears throat> uh, um, a, in, a, a debt capital funding under low Marcora. Uh, participative loans, subordinated loans, subsidized loans. Uh, with the decree new Marcora, uh, um, because in, uh, in the end of uh, 2014, the Minister of Economic Development established uh, a new aid scheme, so-called new Marcora law, this intervention, complementary to the Marcora law, provides to the granting of subsidized loans to cooperative companies in which CFI must take on a shareholding that is one fifth of the funding. Uh, and now the Marcora law, the new Marcora law. Uh, the uh, incentives uh, 
favor cooperative startups uh, development and consolidation nationwide it, it can be granted and can be granted alternatively for sending sending up investment programs to conclude to be con concluded within 36 months and company liquidity needs um, for example raw materials um, uh, consumable ma materials uh, service and goods uh, necessary to carry out the company business uh, personal costs uh, um, the new marcora uh, the fund of new marcora has an, uh, an availability of 81 million euro uh, the funding is a, a, as a duration uh, of not less than three years and not more than years than ten years, with a grace period of up to three years, as an amortization plan in in uh, fixed defer, deferred six monthly uh, installments expiring the thirty one May and thirty November at third the November of each of each year is regulated uh, at an interest rate of zero percent is granted against the new investments and uh, and in this case can cover the total amount of the investment program and for liquidity requirements is granted for an amount of not more than two millions and however not more uh, then five times the share quota or, uh, already held by the financing company CFI uh, under the, the fund of the Marcora law. Uh, the decision to grant the funding is conditioned by the positive outcome of the checks foreseen by the anti-mafia code by the national state aid register and by the verification of the due tax and social security contributions. Um, uh, but uh, in, in addition to, to the Marcora law, to, to Marcora law, other provision, provision in the Italian regulatory framework uh, uh, um, uh, have contributed to the spread of worker buyouts in Italy. First, the workers entitled to the payment of an employment benefits can ask to obtain in advance the payment of the total amount due in a single solution to, to buy shares of a cooperative and to start a new activity. Workers who wish to use the unemployment benefit must make a request directly to the National Security Institute. The amount in advance to workers is not taxable if reinvested in a new cooperative. Second, the most important intervention, intervention in recent years is, however, the possibility for employees of firms in crisis that are undergoing judicial proceedings, for example, bankruptcy, to benefit of a preemptive right to purchase these companies or its branches via a cooperative. Uh, you can find in the document I sent, uh, I sent you the references and the extract of the rules I mentioned. Um, um, Finally, I, I would uh, I, I would like uh, to I like one last point. Marcora law funds are revolving funds that create, as indicated in a survey of uh, 55 cooperatives financed from 2013 uh, uh, to 2018, a virtuous cycle. First, create employment. Second, generate economic return for the state. Third, repaid by workers by allowing new projects to be financed. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Camilla. That's really appreciated that you've uh, joined us this evening and have shared those insights as to how the Macora law actually works in Italy and um, so that we can shape these conversations about how we can uh, how we can hopefully do something similar over here in the UK. So I'm really grateful for your time. And if there are any other um, uh, documents which you wanted to, to share with us, we'll make sure to obviously share those with participants on the call as well. So thank you. Um, and I think that, you know, those those numbers that you mentioned are, are, are they, they they really speak for themselves. I mean, what was it? You know, the, the, uh, the, st since the thirty first of December twenty nineteen. Sorry, just looking as I wrote down. You know, five hundred and twenty co ops have been created, and twenty two thousand jobs have either been saved or created as a result of the Marcora Law, which is just incredible. So, thank you for that. And um, we have had it. Sorry, uh, uh, last thing: uh, the the success rate. Uh, um, has exceeded 82% uh, of the total financed. This is important. Uh, Thank you. No, that's a really important figure, as you say, to demonstrate the success rate that's being experienced by the fund. Uh, so thank you for flagging that as well. Uh, we have had a, a couple of uh, questions that have been submitted, and uh, I'm conscious we are in the last few minutes, so uh, we'll, we'll try and get through a couple. And uh, obviously, if there are any others that you want to be submitted, we can always try and um, send them on to panellists subsequently as well to ensure that you get responses to those. Um, so the first one that's been submitted uh, by John is, um, if we are able to implement the Macora law in the UK, uh, how long do we think it would take to start seeing the impact of this type of legislation? Is this ultimately a, a, a long term solution or will we see the benefits of it in the short term as well? Um, and what I'll do is I'll, I'll come to a couple of panellists on each of these questions so that we can uh, get a, a flavour for answers. And um, so first of all, if I come to Christina on that one. Thanks very much, Emma, and thank you, John, for the very important question. Um, I think it's probably a, a long-term plan. Having listened to Camillo um, very eloquently, and I love the accent, by the way, um, set out the system in Italy, it's very sophisticated. Um, it's well thought out. Uh, it works. Um, the statistics that Camilla put forward uh, prove that it's a successful scheme. So um, I think we've got two areas. I mean, politically, we have to persuade um, uh, the UK government to take it on, um, or uh, we have to uh, hope for a Labour government uh, with Ed Miliband's proposals in that and take it through that way. Um, similarly, in Wales, um, uh, hopefully, um, uh, even though the stumbling blocks are the, the additional powers that they, they will need, that the, the Welsh Parliament will need, um, we have to make progress. Um, but um, the benefits that Derek set out um, is there and it's proven that uh, cooperatives are the way forward. And so I think that we have to put a lot of planning into this and we have to make it work. Um, because the more I listen to the Macora Law model, the new Macora Law model, I'm totally convinced that, that it can only bring uh, prosperity to, uh, to workers, to the local economy. And we, we have to really pull together, work together cooperatively to make this work. Brilliant. Thank you, Christina. Uh, on this one, if I can come to Derek as well, and then I think we'll probably have time to squeeze one more question in. So if I can ask you, Derek, to, to be quite concise in your answer. Yeah, um, yeah, I guess it you could see, it is a long term thing, but you could start to see some benefits quite quickly, depending on what was part of this. So if this was about um, giving workers, you know, which is a key part of it, the, the, the right to be asked and involved and uh, to be able to take on the business, well, that would apply straight away, wouldn't it? So um, that could see um, some relatively um, quick benefits. Um, I just wanted to respond to some of the, the other points, if that was quickly, because I've seen them on the screen. <laughs> is that OK, Emma? I mean, I think, you know, Mary's point is um, an interesting one, but I, I, I'm not too worried about that because partly what we're doing here is levelling up things, uh, to hate to use that term, but we're making it uh, fairer, I think, for... Um, employee-owned businesses because uh, employee ownership 
um, is often seen as more risky by financiers and um, legal people and it sometimes can make it more difficult for them to come about than other companies so I wouldn't see it as undermining traditional businesses you know for all the reasons that I mentioned we want to see more of these businesses in the economy and so it, you know if our policy objectives are a fairer greener economy then um, you know we should be uh, leveling the playing field for these types of businesses and um, I think Richard has ans answered uh, John's question about the the, you know, the company structures, uh, you know, I, I think they're usually um, share companies with the, the business owned in a, an employee ownership um, trust legal model. Um, but um, I would agree with Richard, you know, um, worker co-ops uh, are more democratic and, um, uh, you know, have a, a you know, dem democracy at the, the real heart of them. So we need to be helping worker co-ops uh, to have the same sort of benefits as employee ownership structures. So um, I fully support what Richard said. Thank you. And uh, we've got time for just just one more that uh, that I thought we'd uh, squeeze in before. I know people have got uh, other things to dash to at half past. Um, so what are the obstacles? Uh, this is from Kate, sorry. What are the obstacles to a Macora law in the UK? Um, is it just an indifferent government in Westminster or what are the other obstacles? And I'll come very quickly for a minute answer each. Uh, firstly to Hugh and uh, then I'll come over to Matthew. Hugh. Well, it's probably I'm probably the wrong person to ask because I'm back <laughs> here in Wales. But look, my reading would be as, a, as an MP of 15 years standing before I came back to Wales. Yeah, it, it is the question of having a government that's willing to listen to this and doesn't have, as we hear from the one Conservative who contributed to our debate today, seeing this as a, a throwback to a previous century. As, as we said to him, this is actually a modern version of Macora law that we're looking at, which is looking forward, not looking backward. Um, so I think that's the problem at a UK level at the moment, and hence why I think we need a government open to these arguments. We, we need a UK Labour government, frankly. Thank you, Hugh. And then coming over to Matthew, I suppose the other part of that question is, uh, do you think beyond the UK government, are there any other obstacles that exist to a Macora law? Um, there probably are. I mean, I think one thing I'd say, just uh, the, I think we overestimate how much we can change in two years, but we underestimate how much we can change in like a decade. So I think even if there's no laws, I think sort of cultural and social pressure, you know, um, the cooperative movement pushing it, et cetera, can really make a difference over time. Um, I'd say like, the key thing really would be continue to develop so if and when there is a Labour government at the UK level there are you know champions like Chris who can work with uh, you know an Ed Miliband, Bayes, Department etc cetera, etc cetera, to make sure it's that really does happen and really gets going um, and then be, you know, beyond that working with yeah, as mentioned earlier sort of the Welsh government etc cetera, etc cetera, to sort of try and eke out as far as possible um, with the powers they have um, the sort of framework for doing that. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, I'm afraid it's uh, it's 29 minutes past, and so we're going to have to draw things to a close so people can head off to the uh, to the other things that they've got arranged for the evening. But just to say again, thank you so much for all of those contributions, both from our speakers and from our members. It's been genuinely fascinating to hear about the need and the importance of worker buyout whether it's from our politicians who are obviously pushing up the political agenda, our colleagues in the co-op sector on what it would what it would mean and for those areas, and of course from Camillo about the difference it's already making in Italy. Um, so much for us all to think about and ideas for how we might take this campaign forward. Uh, but for now, though, just to say thank you all for joining us and have a good rest of your evening. Thank you.